Good evening and welcome to tonight's Feline webinar, kindly sponsored by Feline Friends. Feline Friends are a fantastic charity aimed at improving the welfare and standards of cats all over around Earl in the UK. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I just want to do some housekeeping. Um, I'm sure many of you have joined us previously, uh, but those of you who haven't, um, we'll be introducing the speaker shortly, but and throughout the presentation, we encourage you to uh, type questions into the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of the screen, or for some people it might be at the top, but predominantly it'll be at the bottom. Uh, so just click on Q&A, type in your question, and we will actually come to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So we won't answer, ask questions during the presentation, but at the end, any questions are being asked, we'll work through them uh, as depending on how much time we have left. Hopefully you can all hear me and you can see the screen. If you do have any technical issues though, please do um, just further along from the Q&A box, there's a chat box. So please uh, click on that and you can type in any issues you may have. And my colleague Luke is on hand to help deal with them. Alternatively, you can email office at thewebinarvet.com and Luke once again will be there to answer any of those questions as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, on to tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is on the topic of feline lower urinary tract disorders with the uh, title of What's All the Fuss? It Hurts When I Pee. So, and we're delighted that we're joined by a fantastic speaker tonight, Margie Shirk. Margie graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College in 1982. In 1986, she opened the Cats Only Veterinary Clinic in Vancouver, practicing there until 2008 when she retired from regular practice. While in practice, she published several clinical trials, including the first paper on transdermal fentanyl patch in veterinary medicine. She has written many book chapters, co-edits the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery, and has served extensively on committees with the AAFP, North American Vet, Vet Licensing Exam Board. She continues to assist colleagues with case management, and enjoys teaching about all things feline, Include improved interacting with cats, analgesia, nutrition, gastroenterology, and kidney disease. So, if like me, you settled down and you're uh, I'm being joined by my 13-week-old uh, kitten, uh, we very much look, look, much look forward to hearing what Marky has to say. Over to you, Marky. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, at least virtually. Uh, I'm in, uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and uh, so here it is midday. And for you, thank you for joining me at the end of, at the end of your day. This is a topic that has uh, been very, that it's a very serious topic for in that in the past um, it, it, it used to cause a lot of obstructions in cats, uh, which caused a huge amount of pain, but also uh, some cats were uh, euthanized because of it. So very, uh, very serious problem. Uh, the picture has changed somewhat, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, not to say that some cats can't still get obstructions and be very, very ill. But uh, let's, we're going to talk about this, and the reason for the, what looks like a typo in the title is because in the past it was called FUS, or Feline Urologic Syndrome. So what I'm intending to go over here is uh, to help you recognize the signs of cystitis in cats, uh, to discuss what we know about the many causes and types of cystitis in cats, look at how stress affects your cats, what tests your veterinarian will need to run, uh, how to treat different types of cystitis in cats, and how to assess and meet the environmental needs of cats because interestingly, as things have changed, it turns out that the environment a cat lives in plays a huge role in um, all of these uh, problems. So just to give you an idea, this is a, a, not a pretend case. This was my daughter was texting me while I was lecturing in, in Warsaw, and she texted me with uh, saying, Mom, Stella, one of her two cats, is not pooping. She keeps trying, but nothing's happening. And it's important to recognize that, uh, it, that it, you may think that your cat's straining to defecate when, in fact, they're straining to urinate. So she says, hi mom, so this morning in the last 10 minutes, she's tried to pee twice with no success. What should I do? 
And I said, take her into the clinic uh, for your analysis and to be certain that she isn't obstructed. The signs of cystitis are uh, those of, um, are, are due to inflammation. Anytime a word ends with itis, I-T-I-S, it means inflammation of the uh, uh, first part of the word, so in this case, of the bladder. And when there's an inflammation in the bladder, a cat or a person or a dog will void small amounts at an increased frequency because as that the bladder, when it's inflamed, every time urine comes down from the uh, kidneys through the ureters into the bladder, every, time, all, every drop of urine makes the bladder stretch and because it's inflamed, it hurts. So the cat wants to empty the bladder. So they may strain to empty the bladder, even if it's all, already almost empty, or they may strain if the urethra, uh, the, the tube from the bladder to the outside is obstructed. Additionally, because of the burning or, or the uh, inflammation, there may be urgency in urinating and because you have a stretch of an inflamed tissue, there will be blood and it will be, you know, fresh red blood. Because the cat is, um, either because the, it hurts and they just have to go, uh, you know, empty their bladder when they do or when, when they feel the urgency, they may void in inappropriate locations, but many times the reason they may be voiding in inappropriate locations is simply because uh, they're trying to tell us that they have a problem. If they keep using their litter tray or keep voiding outside, we won't know there's a problem. So the only way they can tell us is to void in front of us or in a, a location that they normally don't void in. So I mentioned that the, that the bladder is a, is a reservoir, so it just holds the urine, all, that's its only job, is to hold the urine that is made in the kidneys and that passes through the, ure, uh, through the ureters. The bladder holds the urine, as you can see on the right top right hand side, and when it's healthy, when it's healthy, uh, the urine is yellow and the lining of the, of the wall depicted, of the bladder depicted here in blue and black, um, is intact. However, when it's inflamed, the lining of the wall becomes disrupted and there may be bleeding and blood in the urine uh, and a very inflamed and irritated bladder. In the past, uh, we uh, uh, dealt with cystitis in cats primarily by uh, decreasing the urine pH. Uh, because the main cause of, of uh, uh, cystitis in cats was struvite crystals, triple magnesium, also known as triple magnesium phosphate crystals that form in a basic or alkaline urine. The way we did that was either through using drugs like D-L-methionine or using a diet to make the um, to to make the urine uh, uh, less alkaline, make it more acidic, um, and that, for instance, uh, you may have seen that this diet SD. Additionally, since then, their diets have been developed, um, such as these on the right, and Hills also has one called CD. And these diets are, are designed to create a neutral pH rather than an alkaline or an acidic pH. The reason for that is because as we have um, uh, adjusted the pH of the urine and made it more acidic, while we no longer see as many struvite crystals, we now see a different type of crystals that forms in an acidic urine. Therefore, it's best to have the urine in a more neutral pH. Additionally, by diluting the urine, making the, uh, uh, we reduce the chance of crystals Forming. The minerals that are in the crystals, it's, it's as if I were to take a uh, tablespoon of salt and add to it a quarter cup of water and stir it up. Some of the crystals would still be, some of the salt would still be a little white uh, pile in the bottom of the cup. But if I add 
another half a cup of water to that, those crystals will dissolve. So what we try to do is to dilute the urine to make those crystals, uh, uh, make it less likely that crystals can form. And those diets that I showed you in the preceding picture are designed to do that as well. So historically, uroliths uh, and plugs, so crystals and stones and, and plugs, were um, primarily triple magnesium phosphate, but these crystals or stones, as you can see here in this, depicted in the um, ureter of a male cat in the penis here, um, would would clog the penis and they might be, these are all struvites and they can take different shapes. And this is a struvite plug. So it can be this squishy mucinous type uh, um, plug. In this uh, slide, I'm just showing you how over time on the bottom, you can see the years as they've gone by. And if we look at the struvite type of what depicted with the square, uh, with the box, you can see that the number of struvite uh, stones and uh, has stayed about the same, but the oxalates has, have actually increased. So just by changing the pH of the urine, we have created another, a new problem. So back to Stella. So she took her into, my daughter took her into the clinic and she was getting fluids and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as well as having a urinalysis done, but they weren't able to get urine because her bladder was empty. So my response to that was good. So she's not got an obstructed urine, that's uh, obstructed bladder rather, and that's very important because that's the life-threatening and um, uh, problem. But the reason her bladder is empty is because it burns or, or uh, every time it, it's filled. So she's emptying small amounts frequently. So it's an inflammation of the bladder, cystitis of some sort then, and it'll take some time for her to make some urine. So we now, instead of talking about FUS, feline urologic syndrome, or FLUTD, feline lower urinary tract disorders or diseases, as we've talked about in the past, we're now calling them lower urinary tract signs. Because in fact, these lower urinary tract signs can occur, these, these, these small amounts frequently, blood in the urine, inappropriate locations, straining, can occur even with disease outside of the bladder. Here we've got um, in this uh, graph or, or figure rather, we have lower urinary tract signs and we're always going to want a history from, from you when you bring your cat in. We're gonna perform a physical examination and collect a urine sample for a urinalysis. We may or may not want to do a urine culture and sensitivity if, there, if we see bacteria in the urine sample. And we'll probably want to do some form of imaging, namely x-rays or ultrasound, to have a look at the urinary tract. It's unlikely we're going to do a biopsy, but certainly part of a urinalysis, uh, of a proper urinalysis, is, is doing urine cytology, looking at the urine underneath the, the microscope as well. And as you can see, with the, when we do this data, collect this data, we come up with a whole bunch of different causes. It could be a neurological problem, or it could be uh, incontinence or trauma causing these signs. It could be cancer, it could be behavioral urinary tract infection, iatrogenic, meaning that we uh, have induced the problem or caused the problem perhaps by passing a, a urethral catheter. Uh, it could be urethral obstruction, um, crystals, or idiopathic disease. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about idiopathic disease. The word idiopathic just means we don't know what um, the cause is. And this idiopathic cystitis can, uh, can uh, usually has recurrent lower urinary tract signs. And it may be self-limiting. Um, uh, well, it usually is self-limiting. And sometimes it, it too can cause urethral obstruction. FIC stands for feline um, idiopathic cystitis. I'll talk about this idea of Pandora syndrome uh, in, a, in a moment. 
So if we look at urethral obstruction, I did want to focus on that for a moment in that we've got, uh, whenever you have inflammation, you don't necessarily have to have crystals to cause a plug. You could have a plug just from inflammation. If you think about uh, what happens if you um, bang your, if, if, if you cut yourself, that the tissue around it becomes red, sore, uh, swollen, and that swelling uh, is because uh, of its, your body is calling other cells in to clean up the in infection or prevent infection from occurring. And so you have, with that swelling, that swelling itself, as well as those cells, can cause a protein matrix um, to, to uh, 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 or, or even plugs to occur that may cause obstruction. Additionally, uh, you can also have, pardon me, you can also have spasm of that urethra because it's inflamed. If any time you have, um, with that inflammation, it's swollen and, and there may be an actual spasm in the muscles around the urethra, which can cause obstruction too. So that's even without having crystals um, or stones. So urethral obstruction, here you've got a, a cross section of a bladder and you can have these plugs that occur, that, that this is made up of some, some crystals, but primarily it's blood and cells. Here's one that's, that's matrix without blood, but these, you can imagine how these would cause an obstruction even though they are, um, uh, there's, it, they're just from inflammation. Crystals, of course, too, can cause a, a mechanical obstruction. Now, when we talk about this idiopathic cystitis, which in people is called interstitial cystitis, these pictures here are from uh, what it looks like in, in people where when a, 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 a scope is passed into the bladder, a healthy bladder has a, has a nice uh, pale pink surface with blood vessels uh, running along it, whereas in, in someone with idiopathic cystitis, they will have these um, bleeding, these, these little bruising um, areas from bleeding. Uh, it's almost like a cluster of grapes. But regardless, what's important to remember is that whatever the cause is, the clinical signs are going to be the same. The cat's going to be straining, will be passing small amounts of, of urine, increased frequently, licking themselves uh, in their nether regions, and will have some blood in the urine. Now, the blood may be really obvious, as is in the uh, bottom right hand corner, but the picture that looks uh, of the urine specimen on the, uh, just to its left, while it looks quite yellow, actually has red blood cells in it as well. When we look at, the, uh, at some of the statistics, which cats get which type of lower urinary tract disease, uh, cats with uh, 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 younger cats are more likely to have struvite or calcium oxalate crystals. And in fact, the struvite crystals are in, in the youngest group of cats, uh, on average about four to seven years of age, whereas calcium oxalates are more common. Uh, the prevalence is maximum, uh, ma maximum occurrence around seven to 10 years of age. However, under 10 years of age, idiopathic disease is the number one cause and is more common than either calcium oxalate, struvites, or plugs. Whereas in cats over 10 years of age, this is when we need to start thinking about bacteria playing a role. So we really do not want to, in these younger cats, be putting them on antibiotics. It makes no sense and it may be detrimental. When we look at idiopathic cystitis, these under 10 years of age cats, it's maximal at about two to seven years of age, especially common in cats who are kept strictly indoors. Um, and uh, if they're overweight, that contributes to it as well. Additionally, they may be in multiple cat homes and are susceptible to stress. 
So stepping back further, if we look at this graph on the bottom right, this pie chart on the bottom right, you can see that feline idiopathic cystitis is the largest cause, it's in blue, when compared to uroliths, which is the red, and then other and plugs. So then this is the younger cats. Um, not the not the older group of cats, but the cause of the of, of the lower urinary tract signs is unknown. In other words, it's idiopathic in over 64% of cats with non-obstructive lower urinary tract disease. And it may in fact be multifactorial within the same patient. So to look at this differently, again, if we rank the causes of lower urinary tract disorders, idiopathic cystitis. Is the, it gets the gold medal. Urolithiasis in the, in the younger cats um, it get, uh, gets the silver medal. And in the older cats, we start seeing urinary tract infections. Of course, there are also, it's also possible that other things happen such as uh, stones or crystals in the ureters or in the kidneys themselves, ureteronephrolithiasis. There can be reproductive tract disorders that look just like uh, lower, have the same clinical signs. Uh, cancer and anatomic defects uh, can also have the same signs. But remember, the clinical signs are always small amounts, increased frequency, straining, urgency, blood, inappropriate urine uh, locations, um, and there is blood available, either gross hematuria, so obviously red urine, or microscopic hematuria. And remember that anything that, that causes lower urinary tract signs can cause obstruction, even if there aren't crystals um, or um, uh, uh, plugs involved. Inflammation can cause plugs. Inflammation can cause spasm. So we have to be thinking about why in, in an obstructed cat, we have to be thinking about why is the urethra obstructed? It's easy to, to imagine if there is a plug in, this is a cross section of the urethra, if there's a plug in the lumen or opening of that urethra, uh, that can obviously cause a problem, but it can also be from spasm, as I've already said, or inflammation of the wall of the urethra itself. Finally, it can also be that there is something outside of the urethra that is compressing the urethra so the urine can't flow through it. Uh, traditionally, we've always thought about the plugs or urethras and uh, plugs or uroliths. Uh, it, and this is depicting, depicting a uh, plug with some crystals at the tip of the cat's uh, penis there. So uh, to reiterate, more than 64% of non-obstructive lower urinary tract uh, uh, disorders are idiopathic and idiopathic cystitis is multifactorial. There are immunological and neuroendocrine components to this. It results in recurrence um, anytime the cat gets stressed. Now there is a guarded long-term prognosis in male cats with urethral, urethral obstruction in that um, the 53% of obstructed cats, not non-obstructed now, but had idiopathic disease, i.e. no plugs or urolithiasis. It was either due to inflammation um, uh, causing swelling or spasm or inflammation causing a mechanical obstruction by um, sloughing of cells. It's a guarded prognosis in these individuals because 14 of these, of these 39 cats uh, re-obstructed. They had different etiologies. It was irrelevant whether it was idiopathic crystals or plugs. A number of them had re-obstruction. And it's important that, to note that 21% of those 39 cats were euthanized due to re-obstruction primarily due to cost. And because of that, there are other methods to deal with um, an obstructed cat without needing to pass a urinary catheter. Catheterization itself is not without risks. 
in that by passing a catheter in an already through an already inflamed urethra, you can traumatize the urethra and and cause tearing. And this is showing dye, uh, the white substance is, is dye that has leaked out of the out of the urethra. So it's not we're not jumping at passing catheters any anymore the way we used to. So idiopathic cystitis, as I've already said, recurrence is common. Um, between a quarter and a half of cats will have another episode within six months. But what causes the inflammation? We don't really know. It's hard to understand because the clinical signs, the discomfort, uh, uh, will resolve within one to seven days whether or not we treat the cat. However, when you're the one who's got the pain, you want somebody to treat the pain, even if you know that it's going to resolve. It's kind of like having a baby. Um, you want some, the, even though you know eventually you, that that baby is going to be born, it, while you're in labor, you want the, the pain to stop. Signs are going to reoccur in 40 to 60% of cats within one to two years, but we don't know whether it's the same condition each time because remember from that, that figure that I showed you, all of the conditions have the same, all of the many different conditions have the same clinical signs. But the clinical signs and frequency of idiopathic cystitis do seem to decrease as cats get older, thankfully. A small number of them have chronic disease. Um, again, uh, they, it lasts, while, lasts longer. We still don't know whether it's the same disease each time. Now, because it goes away of its own accord after a period of time, it makes it hard to assess the effect of treatments. And indeed, um, over 80 different therapies have been tried. Only a few of them have been studied, those with the asterisks in this table. But we really don't know what works or what doesn't work. And if you um, have a look at this table, you can see uh, lots of drugs, anti-inflammatories and um, uh, analgesics, antidepressants, anxiolytics, antimicrobial agents, uh, antispasmodics, dietary management, alternative medicine, glycosaminoglycans, environmental management, and lots of different categories, and including miscellaneous things, have been looked at. So there's a lot of things we don't know. What do we know? Well, we know it's painful. And in people who have this, uh, have interstitial cystitis, it is caused by and exacerbated by stress. In fact, when we look at interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome in people, the, uh, what's the, the um, uh, consensus now is that first-line treatments include patient education, self-care practices, behavior modification, and stress management, and that management of interstitial cystitis that bladder pain syndrome may also be improved if both patients and doctors treat this condition as a chronic disease. What's also been learned in people is that um, the um, is that this condition is uh, we know that it has immunological and neurological components and that one needs to be looking outside of the bladder to help with the with this problem so what are the causes of stress in cats well some of the things that that have been looked at in this study published last year from uh, south korea looking at 58 cats uh, the risk factors that were statistically significant were cats these, uh, who, were, who uh, did not have the ability to uh, perch and predict when, uh, watch with curiosity, but also predict if a threat was coming, so no vantage point. They were living with other cats, so it's a big stress factor for many of them. Using non-clumping litter, apart, living in an apartment as opposed to a house, and being male were also factors that weren't quite as, um, uh, uh, they were statistically significant, but not as um, ragingly so as living with other cats were having, uh, uh, lacking a vantage point. 
So living with incompatible cats, it's easy to look at this at first glance. If you look at this picture, uh, you may think that these three cats, because they're all together on the bed, are get, get along. In fact, um, Monty is fine with, uh, with either Jules or Nimitz, but Nimitz, uh, Nimitz and Jules absolutely loathe each other. The reason that, and if you look at the body language, you can see that. They may even be touching on the bed, but it will be with great discomfort on their part. The reason they're, they're sharing the bed is because the bed is an important resource, both from comfort's sake, as well as proximity um, to uh, us. So the stress may be their own stress from uh, their living situation, maybe living with a dog or living with children or, or having visitors or having renovations done or something like that. But it can also be from maternal stress, meaning that when we are in utero, uh, the experiences of our mother uh, uh, will uh, affect her systemic, um, or pardon me, her sympathetic nervous system and her, her stress level, her adrenal glands, and all of that floods through the placenta, floods the, the fetus. And so the fetus is constantly being exposed to the mother's stress. Here are a number of papers looking at the effects of the famine in the Netherlands during when the Nazis invaded Holland and the effects on the adult offspring on the offspring of those of the women who were pregnant during that time. And they're not so much physical as they are uh, physiological or psychological. So this, the, the Dutch famine and its long-term consequences for adult health, transgenerational effects of prenatal exposure to the famine. Here's another one from the China famine, uh, long-term effects of early life development, but it goes beyond that. Here you've got parental post-traumatic stress disorder as a vulnerability factor for low cortisol in offspring of Holocaust survivors. So in this case, the people weren't pregnant at the time, but they became pregnant afterwards and certainly had um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and that affects the offspring. Acute maternal stress in pregnancy and schizophrenia in the offspring of those uh, People, Association of the World War II Finnish evacuation of children with psychiatric hospitalization in the next generation. So it's absolutely fascinating that we're, what we're learning about the effects of um, our mothers and actually even goes back to our grandmother's stress on uh, our own health. And there's no, every reason to think that this occurs in cats as well. So I'll talk a bit about the environment because the environment is extremely important as far as the cat's own stress or lack thereof. Um, and I'll talk a bit about diet. Dehydration plays a role in so much as if, you, if the urine is very concentrated, it, even if there aren't um, it makes it more likely that crystals can form, but even so, if the urine's concentrated and the bladder wall is damaged, then it is a more noxious substance uh, for that damaged bladder wall. There are no infectious agents known to, to be associated with lower urinary tract disorders, um, save when there's actually a bacterial uh, infection. All right, so going, getting back to Stella. Other than in her litter box, I asked my daughter, how does she seem to feel? And my daughter said, we went for a nightmare of a walk yesterday. I've never seen her so scared. But other than that, she's fine. And I said, on a leash outside, and today is the first time that she's straining in the box? So this was a, is a classic situation. Um, my daughter had just moved two weeks earlier and so had kept the cats in for two weeks. And this was the first time she was taking um, one of them out one at a time so that they would get accustomed to the new environment. 
So here we've got someone who has an abnormal response to stress, not just being frightened, but actually having physiologic response to that where she develops a cystitis as a response in, in as a result to her stress. An exaggerated sympathetic nervous system response and catecholamine, that's adrenaline or epinephrine release, and, um, and, a, and a blunted endocrine response and a blunted cortisol response because in utero she had was exposed presumably to her mother's um, higher cortisol level due to stress while, um, while that queen was pregnant. But there's still more. In that with interstitial cystitis, uh, there are also very commonly associated medical conditions. And this uh, pie graph shows that 59% of the people with it with um, interstitial cystitis also have irritable bowel syndrome, 27% have fibromyalgia, 14% have chronic fatigue syndrome. And this is a condition that Dr. Tony Buffington has, uh, has coined as the Pandora syndrome. So the Pandora syndrome refers to, uh, refers to finding uh, when, when you open the box, um, all, all of the evils of the world come out. And here, we're finding that, in fact, lots of conditions go together. They're so having comorbid health conditions. And oftentimes, these individuals, be they cats or, uh, and there we're speculating, but with people, we know there's a history of early adverse experiences or severely stressful events in their in their mothers, and in uh, it may also happen that in people or in cats that they had stressful experiences uh, um, once their paws or feet hit the ground, so after they'd been born. Environmental events affect the presentation of clinical signs. So what Dr. Buffington has said in, in this article from FUS to Pandora syndrome is that the bladder is not always the perpetrator of lower urinary tract signs, but rather that the bladder can also be one victim of a systemic process associated with a sensitized central stress response system. That, us, that what we're looking at is a susceptible individual. So in this case, Stella, my daughter's cat, um, was susceptible with this, uh, she was a vulnerable and she was a susceptible individual put into a provocative situation, which then allowed the, these clinical signs um, that, uh, to um, uh, show up. And this may explain the impact of stress as well as why these, this condition comes and goes or waxes and wanes. Remember again, I'm going to reiterate that um, the majority of cats who have, with lower urinary tract disorders or signs have idiopathic disease rather than a specific um, etiology. Dr. Buffington also looked at multimodal environmental modification where he, he found that even so, uh, apparently healthy cats can develop these sickness behaviors when exposed to sufficiently provocative environments. And so it's important to meet their environmental needs. And here you don't want, not only do you not want a barren environment, you also don't want a, a chaotic environment. So we don't want to have too many toys and cats need to be able to get away from us. They don't want us fussing over them all the time. And if we find that happy medium, just like Goldilocks with the, with the uh, just right uh, porridge, then we have optimal health. So what, to reiterate regarding Pandora syndrome, if we have the Tom and we have the Queen, they provide a genetic predisposition. Uh, additionally, then, during a sensitive period before the, the kitten is born, the queen, if she is stressed, then we have an, uh, all these endocrine, uh, uh, these hormones that get released, cortisol re releasing factor, and, and uh, we have a... a, a, a um, 
sympathetic nervous system gets, gets ramped up and we have uh, the adrenal cortex size shrinks in the fetus because it's constantly being exposed to a lot of cortisol in the queen. Then the kitten is born, then something happens in the environment and the cat may recover or, these, or they may express disease, not just something like idiopathic cystitis, but they may express a disease such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease or skin disorder or um, asthma or behavior problems. So these are things that can all be a result of uh, being a sensitized individual in a, um, uh, or, or a susceptible individual in a provocative environment. So what tests does your veterinarian need to run? Well, and how do we manage these cats, especially when, when we've tried to change diet, but they have another episode? We have to rule out other causes. So we have to do another uh, phys comprehensive physical examination. Um, and if at all possible, watch the cat avoiding, uh, but that's, uh, oh, that's only <laughs> rare, believe me, cats rarely avoid on, on command. We have to do a urinalysis, which is a proper urinalysis, consists of looking at the color of the urine as well as smelling the urine, assessing the concentration of the urine with a, this device called a refractometer, look, looking at uh, uh, blood and other parameters on urine strips, and looking at the cells within the urine. Um, it is not a complete urinalysis without doing uh, evaluating a urine sediment microscopically. So blood, as I've already said, is, is part of any lower urinary tract problem, and it may be microscopic or macroscopic. And using the dipstick, uh, that the this stick on the bottom right hand side, it can it does not differentiate between blood or hemoglobin and myoglobin. And we need to know the difference. And the only way we can tell the difference is through microscopic evaluation. We also want to ideally figure out where the blood is from. Is it from the kidneys? In other words, it's actually not lower urinary tract, but there could be bleeding in the kidneys that then causes a plug that causes the clinical signs. Um, obviously, that's going to be treated differently. Is it from the, the ureter? Is it from the bladder? Is it from the urethra? Or is it from the genital tract? So uh, it can be from, as I said, blood clots from the uh, blood clots in the bladder or in the urethra from higher up. So we don't want to miss that. And strangulia or straining usually reflects the lower urinary tract, but not always. Now there's two ways we collect a urine sample, and they each have um, advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages, and they evaluate different parts of the urinary tract. A cystocentesis, which is the preferred way of collecting a urine sample, it involves sticking a needle into the cat's bladder, and it's useful for culture, but it can also result in some, in some blood entering the urine that we have caused, and it, and it is uh, confusing then to know whether the blood is due to technique. It's not poor technique, it's simply due to, it's what happens with the technique, or whether it is um, it actually the blood was, was already present. Uh, cystocentesis, very, very unlikely, but it's just one of those things that has to be mentioned, could potentially rupture uh, bladder, but that's extremely um, it, unlikely. I've never heard of it actually happening. And it evaluates the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. However, when we do a so-called free catch sample or avoided sample, which usually is not free catch at all, it's usually um, us collecting it from the, the table or, or from the cage floor, the, the, if there's blood in it, there's, it, it's not due to technique, so that's an advantage. But it's difficult to perform in cats and it's usually contaminated, so we can't use it for culture, should culture be warranted. Um, uh, but it does also evaluate the entire tract, uh, including the urethra, and it, depending on whether it's a male or female, the prostate um, and the vagina. 
So blood always means there's damage to the mucosal lining somewhere. We just don't know um, where, where it is yet. Uh, and, and as I said, if it's a free catch sample that we see blood, we know it's significant. If we get blood in a cystocentesis collected sample, a needle, needle sample, then we need to repeat a free catch sample 24 hours later to see whether uh, there's still blood in the urine or not. So that's a nuisance. If there's blood in both the cystocentesis sample and the free catch sample, we know that it, it, there is truly bleeding and it could be anywhere in the urinary tract from the kidneys down to the vagina. Um, if there's blood in the free catch sample but not in the cystocentesis sample, then we know that it's from the urethra of the prostate um, or the vagina. So why would we want to monitor blood? We, we, after we've made our diagnosis, we've treated, et cetera, why would we want to monitor? Well, if we, anyone with lower urinary tract signs, i.e. having strangulia and palaciuria, so straining to urinate and, and passing small amounts frequently, if they've had crystals in the past, we want to follow up to assess the success of the diet. If we've got recurrent idiopathic cystitis, we want to follow up to assess the success of reducing stress through making changes in the environment. If, it pers if the blood persists, then we want to need to do further workup. We can use either the strips or we can use these lovely beads that you just sprinkle on top of the cats of the litter that you're already using. You don't have to buy any special litter and stress your cat out further by changing the type of litter, but rather using the litter that you already use, you can sprinkle these um, blood detecting crystals on uh, or granules on top. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. All right, so. So backing up a step here, how do we manage these cats? What if you've changed the diet um, to one that dissolves crystals and dilutes the urine? What if the diet doesn't work and the problem reoccurs? What if you have some, uh, still some blood and, and, uh, and some crystals present? We still have to rule out other causes because crystals, some level of crystals, uh, uh, some level of struvite crystals is absolutely normal in cats. So I'm gonna repeat that. It's normal to have some level of struvite crystals in cats. Cats eat meat or a high meat type diet and that causes an alkaline urine. So some struvite crystals is normal. So if you have fine struvite crystals and yet there's blood, you can't assume that the blood is from the crystals. It could be that the blood is from another cause, namely idiopathic cystitis. So if we need to do further evaluation, we're going to um, do some imaging. Uh, either it could, uh, could be plain x-rays like here where you can quite clearly see in this bladder, here's the spine of the cat, the head of the cat is to the left and the tail to the right. There's lots of stones in this bladder, but there's also and this is feces in the colon and here's air uh, in the small intestine, intestinal loops, air is black. And then here you've got uh, uh, two kidneys superimposed on each other. And that's why you see these two ovals. But these white spots are some, uh, are some mineralization. It could be stones inside the kidneys. And additionally, here in the ureter, there's another stone in this space here as well. We want to do some contrast x-rays or ultrasound uh, if we're looking for other things as well. Plus, we need to do some, uh, we need to do some uh, blood work to look for uh, other problems, other causes for the blood being in the urine. And if there, is, um, if there are bacteria with white blood cells, inflammatory cells that have been called in to deal with the bacteria, if those are seen on this sediment exam under the microscope, then performing a urine culture makes sense. Um, why? Because uh, infection predisposes to, to bleeding and many causes of bleeding uh, in the urine uh, affect the immune defenses and therefore may predispose to um, infection. But primarily we're going to be looking at cats, at older cats, uh, namely uh, those over, over 10, years, 10 years of age.
Okay, so back to, back to Stella. This is what her urinalysis looked like and um, how are we gonna treat cystitis? For Stella, we certainly do not wanna be using an antibiotic. Why? There's no bacteria seen here. There's also very few white blood cells. Am I gonna change diet on her? Well, I might want to make her urine more dilute, um, but there are no crystals seen. And if I uh, go and change her diet, that in and of itself is somewhat stressful as well. Uh, she definitely wants some pain relief and some um, non-steroidals uh, and some fluids to dilute her urine. The glucosaminoglycans won't be particularly useful. All right, I just wanted to very briefly mention that um, we don't want to be uh, using anti, we don't want to be using antibiotics indiscriminately. I'm sure you've heard about antimicrobial resistance development. It's very real. And while there are so many conditions we don't die from anymore because anti, we have antibiotics, they are becoming less, effect, uh, less effective and some of our offspring may die from um, currently treatable um, conditions. So I'm just going to slip uh, through some cells, uh, slides here because I know I'm uh, running short on time. So uh, what I want to talk about is meeting environmental needs as well as ensuring that she is well hydrated. Um, hydration is extremely important, having wide, clean bowls, uh, preferably glass or uh, uh, glass or metal or ceramic rather than plastic, running water, ice in the water. Um, we want to keep those the, her urine nice and dilute. Feeding multiple small meals will help her drink more as well. We want to encourage voiding to decrease retention of crystals. No one wants to use a latrine that looks like that in order to encourage her to empty her bladder. In other words, to use the litter tray, it needs to be kept nice and clean. I apologize that I'm sl uh, sliding through here. Mm. So stress and sickness, uh, we want to modify the environment to reduce stress. Uh, we can't do anything about the weather. We want to be aware that having visitors uh, and or doing renovations are that our work schedules, uh, the changes all affect um, the, our cats greatly. We want to allow the cat to modify their stress levels on their own by giving them some control, giving them places to hide and get away, giving them the opportunity to play and hunt. Climbing posts and secure scratching trees as well as toys to, to uh, chase and catch. Indoor cats may uh, be lacking stimulation, especially if they're, they're, they live on their own. However, as, as I have already mentioned before, being in a multiple cat household, unless the cats truly get along well, can be a source of stress um, as well. So we want to make sure that the, that the food and water bowls are not side by side, that they are in, uh, that they are separated, that there's more than one of each, uh, and that they are not necessarily in the kitchen. Uh, we want to be in, in, making the living space larger by building up for the cats and putting shelves on the walls that they can climb on. Uh, and, um, uh, there's a, this is an, an article that uh, anyone can get hold of, optimizing an indoor lifestyle for cats that, that talks about this, as well as this very, very important document um, about meeting environmental needs. Uh, the environmental needs that we have to meet are, for cats are having a, a safe space, having multiple and separated resource stations, um, the resource stations being food, water, litter, having a bed, a perch, uh, non-moving non scratching surfaces, and toys. Everything must be easy to access and out of any place where a cat feels that they might be ambushed. We want to provide for an opportunity for play and expression of predatory behaviors. Provide positive 
consistent and predictable uh, interactions with people and, and offer an environment that respects the importance of a, of a cat's sense of smell. These are all extremely important and I would love to just talk about those with you for, for some time. As I mentioned before, resources, this is chaos. No, this is overwhelming for a cat. We want to have a few toys out at a time, only rotate the toys if, uh, if it helps you um, feel better about uh, having, um, providing your cats with a variety of things. Detecting hematuria early is important when we're managing lower urinary tract disease. Um, as I said, when we use a needle to collect, we may not know if the uh, blood is significant or not. So we can use a non-absorbent litter um, or we can use granules that detect the presence and degree of hematuria. These are these granules that you just sprinkle on the litter and there's a color change that occurs um, to tell you how much blood is present or not. For idiopathic cystitis and for crystals, no one wants to be taking their cat back into the clinic. And it's also very stressful for the, for the cat to go back into the clinic. So using these beads can be very helpful indeed. As you can see, you just a cat just, um, uh, these are on top of the litter and a cat just voids on them and if there's no blood they will stay white um, and the color changes quickly. You don't have to be there to watch it. It's stable for um, over a day. Uh, the color, uh, and uh, it's a very, very good, good test. I just want to briefly mention a few uh, resources that you might uh, be interested in that you can get hold of uh, at no cost. The environmental needs guidelines I've mentioned, also the guidelines for diagnosing and solving house soiling behavior in cats. Another resource at cliniciansbrief.com is what cat owners can learn about captivity. Um, and in it, there's a household resource checklist. Um, there's an, a cathealthy.ca, uh, things, a very simple infographic for enhancing your cat's environment. The importance of not using bowls to feed cats, but rather using food puzzles. So feeding for physical and emotional well-being and addressing the behavioral needs to improve um, uh, feline health and well-being by how we feed cats. This website, Food Puzzles for Cats, it talks about wet foods, not just dry foods, um, homemade puzzles, rolling puzzles, stationary puzzles, etc. A very good resource. Finally, um, as well as that indoor cat uh, resource I, I mentioned before, um, the Vet Focus article, there's also a wonderful um, ebook, as it were, by uh, Dr. Buffington called Cat Mastery that you might enjoy. I apologize for not getting through all of my slides, but I know I'm short on time here, so we should open this up for questions. I'm, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for that, Maggie, and I appreciate the uh, you had uh, so much more content you could have gone through, but um, it was really, really informative, and I'm sure many people joining tonight will have taken a lot away from that. Uh, as Maggie says, um, there are you know, we do have a little bit of time for questions and i'm sure you've got many uh already going around in your head so please do use the q a box uh to type them in there because this is an opportunity to uh to go over some of the bits that margie may have uh, touched on or you know, talk about your own experiences uh just want to uh reiterate once again it's thanks to feline friends that we're able to put on tonight's webinar uh, and thank you to Fiona and Friends for all the fantastic work they do in supporting um, our loved felines. So have we got any? So I think um, just give you um, a couple of uh, things. So, so uh, Brian said, thanks, Margie. Um, Saskia has said, can we have the last slides? I don't know in terms of... Um, Obviously, you had to skip through quite a few of the last ones, Margie. Um, were, do they make sense on their own, or is it more uh, needing you to talk through them just uh, in case there was any relevant inf bits of information that you had to skip through to keep the time? 
I think if you if you're going to uh, if you have access to the whole slide set, um, uh, you the slides should speak for themselves. I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So I'm um, just thinking in terms of of the uh, the slides that we've got because you shared the presentation with us. Um, I'm just thinking how we could make that available to people just to be able to well, see what, the last few what I can do is because of course as you know I've changed them up a little bit mm -hmm. uh, since I sent them in to you is I can just make a PDF of them yeah that'd be fantastic and I'll just I'll just email you or Don the PDF brilliant that's great so if you can do that then Saskia um it's your question we can then get that um send out the email afterwards and make that available so that'd be great thank you Margie Pleasure. um <clears throat> question um someone's asked uh, Noel is where can we get the blood detecting granules from please ah excellent so you get them through your veterinarian and they uh if they're they're just it's a new product and they're just being uh, launched and and so some veterinarians have them in hand others don't yet if your veterinarian doesn't have them in hand um just ask to tell you know you can tell them about them and, and ask them to get them um, I did want to just again reiterate the reason I like these over the uh, you can buy there's uh, at least in in Canada I know there's a type of litter you can buy that has granules in it that detects a variety of things but um, a it's not, it, it, the, the color changes aren't stable, meaning you have to actually be there and see it. Um, B, with depending on what the parameter is, it may not even change. Um, and, and C, it causes more stress for, and is more expensive than just using your regular litter and sprinkling these on top. And as you say, it is a relatively new product. Yeah. And we were saying before the webinar started that, we are going to be doing a webinar on the uh, this product uh, in the near future, so um, we'll keep for an eye out for that for vets. Yeah. Uh, for so, vets. For, so vets will become more um, well known with the product, and then, as you say, you should be able to uh, speak to them in more detail about that. Um, Veronica's asked, "What can be done if blood is detected in the urine and pretty much normal reasons are discarded?" can it be considered that there's nothing to do or is there always an underlying issue? Well, there's always an, an, an underlying issue. And if there is, if there, if it's not a physical one, then it is a psychological slash emotional slash stress, whatever we want to call it one, because this is the whole thing with interstitial cystitis in people where we know it's, um, there's the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immunological system are all involved. And so we need to be looking at, uh, you know, and, the, and, and people with this condition are told to practice yoga, deep breathing, have warm baths, go for walks, have a glass of wine, you know, all these sorts of things. So in, in what we can do for cats there, after we have ruled out things like stones or crystals and, and um, uh, those sort of more um, stone in earth kind of things we need to be, be looking at, at, and this is why I really wanted to spend some time on and meeting environmental needs, you know, having uh, the placement of your bowls is, is, you know, if you have more than one cat, um, first off, Cats hunt alone and eat alone, so they don't have their bowls side by side in general, unless they were raised together as kittens. And um, th so the bowls should be, and plus they shouldn't be in the kitchen. They, they want to be fed in a very low traffic area and where they, they have privacy and can't be attacked. Um, cats in their, in their, are inherently wired as being prey animals. They're, they're, we think of cats as being predators and relative to a, a small bird or a mouse, they are a predator, but you, you increase the size of the bird or the rodent and the cat becomes the prey animal. And everybody other than small birds and mice um, can predate on cats. So cats are prey animals and, that, and that's how they, how they think. So we really need to make sure that they have all of their basic needs met 
um, in a way they feel safe. So that, that document that I mentioned, the Meeting the Environmental Needs of Cats, is freely available and I strongly recommend that you get hold of that. It's not a difficult read at all. Um, uh, it, I think it's very useful. Fantastic, thank you. So yes, there may not be a medical underlying issue, but as you say, the environment that they're in, the stress there. So it's looking at the right. environmental factors to right. try and eliminate any of those stress points that you've highlighted. And even though none of us want to think that our cats are stressed, it's as we all know from our from ourselves, at least unless you are more fortunate and more sane than, than I am, we all carry around stress and there's things that we're just not necessarily aware of at the time. And of course, we don't want our cats to be stressed and we do the very best we can by them, but that doesn't mean that they aren't inside their own little heads experiencing some stress. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Fran has uh, messaged him. Do you consider puzzle feeders could cause stress frustration. They seem to be the opposite of wide open bowl recommendations for ordinary food bowls. What's your take on that? Okay, um, that's an interesting question. So puzzle, the purpose with puzzle feeders, and, and uh, again, you'll see in the, when I send over the PDF from some of the images, and then maybe there's some that very nice one called, called an um, uh, indoor hunting. And essentially it's a, uh, it's shaped like a mouse and the cat just bats it around and the food falls out. It gives the cat the opportunity to have normal hunting, uh, associate the hunting with eating because that's how it's paired. It shouldn't just be food available. Nobody ever walks into the woods and finds a den with 10 freshly killed mice in it. That just doesn't happen. They have to hunt, kill, um, eat, hunt, fail, hunt, fail, hunt, succeed, kill, um, et cetera. So it's, a, it's an ongoing work and that's normal for a cat to have to work. Uh, having a full food bowl, result, it results in, um, in many cases in overweight cats who are eating because there's nothing else to do. And dry food in particular is very calorically dense. A meal, the equivalent of a mouse, uh, so first off, uh, the average cat, the average five kilogram cat, needs about eight to 10 mice a day if they were spending the energy on hunting and killing them. Eight to, uh, each mouse is the equivalent of 10 to 15 pieces of dry food. That's a meal. 10 to 15 pieces, not a bowl full. So it's, it's um, uh, you know, when you think about, about that, the, the beauty of, a pu of puzzle feeders, and there are so many different kinds, Fran, that they don't, some may be, some of them are, are ridiculously complex. Um, and some cats, uh, of my three cats, two of them will use them, one of them won't. Um, so I still have very tiny portions of dry food out around the, the house on, on a bookshelf, on a window ledge, on top of the dresser. Um, you know, on top of the china cabinet, uh, little saucers, those like mm, some people use for jam, you know, about uh, two inch, four centimeters, five centimeters in diameter with a few pieces of kibble in them uh, around the house, as well as having puzzle feeders. And there's, a, and different cats like different shapes of puzzle feeders. One of mine likes the egg that rocks back and forth. The other one um, prefers a, a, an oval thing that rolls. So, it just it just depends no so basically you we, we we think we're doing the our cats a favor by keeping them well fed but actually due to the energy they're not expending when they would have been if they're out in the wild it's been counterintuitive to them so by getting them to use the puzzles is helping them almost forage more naturally as they would in the wild yeah right and then also there's lots of ipad games they can play too if they're just for to meet their hunting needs if they're um, uh, you know, uh, to, to further stimulate them. It's very, it's especially critical when we have cats who don't have the opportunity to go outside because they, uh, are, they are essentially trapped in velvet lined prisons that are, you know, where every want is, is provided for, but it is still, they don't get to, they don't have their freedom. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. Um, 
So just one more question. Um, and let's see. So I've got a question here. In terms of increased resources to minimize stress, would you consider multiple cat flaps, controlled access, e.g. microchip, would reduce stress, prevention of guarding in multiple cat homes, or increase stress, more apparent vulnerability to the core territory? Fabulous question. So I, I love this whole concept of having uh, the microchip um, access uh, spaces through, or, or controlled spaces through microchip access doors. Um, and I, you know, got them in between, you can put them in the, in the door of an interior door or in the wall between rooms. Um, and that's going to depend on the personality of the cats in the, the, the in the mix of the family because uh, for instance uh, and this works this is extremely helpful when you've got either one cat who likes to have privacy and doesn't want to be pestered by another cat and they can get away into their room or uh, when you've got uh, different cats needing different diets uh, different you know having with different nutritional requirements um, having that them their food be in different rooms uh, and preventing the others from having access to it uh, the issue there is if you've got for instance and I'm just going to use this as an example if you have one cat who has got a mm, more I don't know, dominant personality or bully personality or whatever, who uh, really wants to have access to that, uh, either to the food in the other, it, behind the flap, but, and, they're, and, it, and the flap's not keyed to them, uh, or, uh, and that other, the, or wants to get in there and pester the cat who's in there, and they can't, then when the, the, the cat who is in that room may feel intimidated to come out and may, uh, feel very vulnerable and it may be an ambush situation. So one does have to take that into consideration. And if you have a second entrance or exit to that room, this is what we do with the litter boxes too. There's never just one way in or out so that nobody can ambush them. Um, that, that this, this needs to be taken into consideration and it's not a, it's not a cookie cutter, uh, one size fits all type of, um, answer it depends on the personalities of the individual personalities and the needs of the of the cats in the household brilliant thank you very much um well i think that's us for tonight um i think we could have gone on for a bit longer uh but i'm conscious we've all got um other things we need to be getting on with um and obviously uh, with yourself it's only one in the afternoon so you've got still got the rest of the day ahead of you um just to reiterate um obviously this webinar has been brought to you by feeling friends academy uh, you can head over to the website uh, where the whole library of past webinars are, but also this one and future ones will also be. So um, if you have a look in the chat box, my colleague Luke has posted the um, website there, which is feline-friends-academy.com. Um, so you can go in there and as I say, have it. Uh, regarding the PDF, yeah, Margie has kindly said she'll send, me, uh, send us the PDF. For all of you who have registered for this evening, we will send you an email um, with how to access that PDF as well. So don't worry, you don't need to get in contact with us. In the next couple of days, we'll be sending out an email with a link to that PDF there for you to access. So all these we do is say thank you to Luke for being on hand and supporting us technically. Thank you to yourselves for joining us on this uh, webinar. And then obviously, finally, thank you to Margie for such a fantastic presentation and for answering so many of your questions this evening. So thank you very much to all of you. And I uh, wish you a good night and wish you, welcome you onto a webinar soon. Good night. Good night.